Thank you, choir. We need to have like a flashing red light or something. Oh, not, not um, so I'm going to warn you right up front. I've got a cough drop in my mouth. So at some point during the sermon, it comes flying out. Just pretend like you didn't see it. Um, but, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm dealing with a head cold. The reason my wife isn't here today, hers, I think, has probably dropped into bronchitis. Um, but uh, uh, she was uh, very upset this morning. She did not want to miss. She didn't want to not be with you, but uh, she also didn't want to give it to you. So uh, I think she made the right decision on that. How many people have your Bibles with you today? Hold them up. Be proud. Absolutely. Now, if you don't have it with you, that's okay. There's one uh, probably somewhere in uh, one of the chairs in front of you. Uh, you can grab that and use that today. Or if you have the Bible on your phone or your iPad or whatever it is, that's okay too. We just want you to have a copy of God's Word as we are studying from it. Uh, today we are going to be in 1 John and we're flipping the page over to a new chapter. So we're in chapter 5. We're in the home stretch uh, of, uh, of this book that we've been working through over the last... Uh, six months. Uh, so we're going to look today at 1 John chapter 5 verses 1 through 5. So you can be uh, turning there as, uh, as I kind of introduce this uh, study today. Today has to do with being a winner. Everyone wants to be a winner, right? I mean, we all want to win at whatever we do. It's just kind of hardwired into it. Very few of us enter into some type of contest or event wanting to be the loser. Am I, am I right? Now, our definition of winning may be a little different. You may have a different goal in coming in first, but you still want to win at whatever you are doing. And nobody wants to be perceived as a loser, right? Right. Look at this clip. How many of you remember that? Oh, wow, a lot of you. That's good, because that clip is 45 years old. 1974. Yeah, it was pretty bad copy. That's true. Uh, that's true. I, I, I understand that. Um, but 45 years old. That clip, you know, of the agony of defeat, that guy, his name was, he was a Slovenian sky jumper, or ski jumper, excuse me, Vinko Bogataj. That clip of him wiping out on takeoff, you know, going into the gallery of spectators and, you know, falling all over the place, just limp. Um, that was used by ABC Sports for almost 30 years. Can you imagine reliving your moment of greatest defeat with millions of people over and over and over again, every time you tuned into some great sporting event, certainly the Olympics, uh, you know, was always on there. Now, I don't need a TV. I have Luke. He tells me of all of my shortcomings <laughs> all the time. But the Apostle John was determined that his spiritual children would taste the thrill of spiritual victory and avoid the agony of eternal defeat. And that's one of the reasons that he wrote this letter. See, John knew that just as a great athlete must recreate himself in his body through training, uh, which is then seen in, in strength and speed and the skills necessary for an athletic victory, he knew that great Christians need that new birth, that spiritual uh, birth for victory, which is evidenced through love and obedience and faith. And so in our text today, uh, John lays down a fourfold strategy 
that will enable us to have true victory in our spiritual life. Now, as I said, this is the beginning of chapter 5. That's the final chapter in 1 John. And so uh, we're beginning the Apostle's conclusion to those who are reading his letter. And uh, at this point, he begins to summarize and restate much of what he's already addressed in the first four chapters. And so you're going to notice some common themes and phrases as we work through this uh, final chapter over the next three weeks. So let's read together uh, 1 John 5, 1 through 5. Now I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation just because it's so much easier to follow and understand. But you follow along uh, in your chosen translation and uh, we'll get to the end together. How about that? So this is 1 John 5, 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. We know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God overcomes this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you today that you speak to us. Father, that you would cement in our minds and in our hearts what you have to teach us today. Love and obedience and faith. Lord, that we would gather these things in, that we would be open to your teaching and that it would transform our lives. Father, for me personally, I ask that you would send your spirit to fill me now. Lord, that you would speak through me, that it would not be Mike standing up here speaking, but that it would be your spirit communicating what you would have taught this morning. Lord, I, I thank you for the work that you do in my personal life. I pray for those who could not be with us today through uh, either sickness or, uh, or some other uh, malady. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for those who are traveling, that they would be safe. But most of all, God, I pray that you would speak to us, that we would hear your voice, and that we would uh, internalize the message that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So four strategies. The first strategy that we see is that we can experience true victory by believing in Jesus. Now, if you look at both verse 1 and at verse 5, John speaks of believing. And in verse 4, he talks of victory through faith. John also goes on to, to tell us the object of our belief, in whom we are to believe. And then he gives us a little bit about the scope, what we are to believe. And so, what is the object of our belief? Now, belief is defined as having confidence in the truth, the existence, or the reliability of something, even without absolute proof that one is right in doing so. Now, if, if we went around this room today and we had enough time and we talked to each of you about different beliefs or different things, we would probably find as many opinions about things or beliefs about things as there are people in this room. And that's okay, because to have belief, you don't necessarily have to have absolute proof that one is right in doing so, right? I mean, listen to the politicians who want to be elected to, to office. You know, they believe a lot of things, but not all of them are true, at least from our point of view. So in whom are we to believe? Well, John says that we are to believe in Jesus. The man from Nazareth, the miracle worker, the great teacher. Believe in Jesus, and only in Jesus, he says. Not Peter, not James, not even himself, the elder John. Not Paul, not Jude, not uh, Reverend Moon, or Joseph Smith, or Muhammad, or even Buddha. Believe in Jesus. Jesus, the sole object of our believing, of our faith, is to be Jesus. Now, 
What is the scope of our faith about Jesus? What are we to believe about Jesus? Well, there's quite a lot in Scripture about that. And uh, we have to make sure that we understand those, those very necessary things that we are to believe about. For example, to believe in Jesus doesn't just mean to believe that he existed, to believe that he was a person in history. That's not enough. Nor that he was a great person whose life and teachings have made a deep impact in the world. Yes, that's true, but it's, it's not enough. Nor does believing in Jesus mean that we simply acknowledge that he was more than a mere man. We could even say that he was the Son of God who came from heaven to save us from our sins. You know what? Uh, all three of those things are true, but they're not enough to save us from our sins. James 2.19 tells us that even the devil and the demons believe these things about Jesus. It says they shudder in fear. But that doesn't make them Christians. That doesn't save them for all eternity. Verse 1 tells us that Jesus is the Christ. Now, a lot of people think that Christ is his last name. That, that's not Jesus' last name. If Jesus had a last name, it would have been uh, Bar-Joseph, son of Joseph. Christ is a Greek word that uh, it would have been Christos in, in Greek, uh, but it is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. Do you know what Messiah means? Messiah means the anointed one, the one sent by God. Now, in Old Testament times, people were uh, subject to anointing when they were called to the offices of prophet or priest or king. Uh, for example, uh, when King Saul was uh, appointed by God to be uh, king over Israel, he sent Samuel to anoint him. And Samuel did that uh, in ceremonial fashion. Now, this was a religious rite that was performed to show that Saul, as the king of Israel, was chosen and endowed by God for that kingship, for the leadership at that time. Likewise, the priests, we see in Exodus 28, 14, and prophets in 1 Kings 19, 16, were anointed at God's command. So, in a sense, anyone in the Old Testament who was set apart and consecrated for a servant task was a Messiah because they received an anointing. But the people of Israel were looking forward to that promised individual who was not merely a Messiah, but the Messiah. The promised one. All the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Had God been promising a Messiah. The one who would be supremely set apart and consecrated by God. To be their prophet and their priest and their king. All three. Many people today say and believe many positive things about Jesus. They might say, well, he was a model of virtue. He taught uh, morals that we should follow. Or they may say that he was a great teacher. They may even say that he was a prophet. But most fall very short of saying that he was the Messiah. And this is the great divide between believers and unbelievers. Believers, Because only one who has born, been born again, who is a child of God, can truly confess Jesus as the Christ. Can you do that? You have to ask yourself, can I do that? Now John gives us more information of what we are to believe here in this book. And, in the, and then we find some other things. In verse 5 he tells us to believe that he is the Son of God. Now, of course, a more uh, complete study of scriptures uh, tells us that we are to understand uh, that Jesus is the Son aspect of the one triune God. Uh, just as we say that we are body, soul, and spirit, we have one person with 
uh, with uh, three essences. God is the essence of three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. So it's a little bit different, but it's something that we don't necessarily understand. We can't understand because it's, it's outside of our uh, finite brain, brain's uh, ability to understand. But we find that uh, in Scripture. Jesus is equal in all ways with God the Father and with God the Spirit. In other places in 1 John, we're told uh, other things to believe about Jesus. It says he is the word of life in, verses, in chapter 1, verse 1. He's called our advocate and our atonement in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says that he is come in the flesh in verse, chapter 4, verse 2. That he is the propitiation or the atonement or the uh, appeasing sacrifice for our sins in chapter 4, verse 10. Chapter 4, verse 14 calls him the Savior of the world. So there's many things that we are to believe about Jesus. And so we have to understand that this belief in Jesus uh, is... It, it takes up many parts of us, our mental, our emotional, our volitional, even our, our ethical thoughts, our belief in Jesus are all of these things. Because belief in Jesus involves the whole person. It is not merely an intellectual assent of who he is. It is trusting all that you are in all that he is. To believe in Jesus, the Bible says, is to commit our lives to Him. To trust Him totally and completely for our salvation. We can't hold anything back. We can't think, well, I'm, I'm a good person, so that helps me along a little bit. No, it doesn't. We believe in Him completely and totally. I might believe in my mind... Uh, that a bridge over a very deep gorge with sharp rocks at the bottom will hold me if I walk over it. But I'm only really believing in it when I actually do something about it by committing to walk across that bridge. The same is true for Jesus. It's a whole person and life commitment to Him. And John is telling us that we can have true victory when we believe in Jesus. Now, strategy number two is that we can have we can experience true victory by loving others. Again, this is a common theme. We've talked a lot about loving others uh, as we've worked through this letter. John consistently links faith with love. Through faith, we experience spiritual new birth. We become children of God. We are born of God. And the result of that new birth is a new experience with love. Am I right? Amen. Yes. God first loves us. So in return, we love his other children. We love one another. But we must first have a genuine love for God. He first loved us, and He demonstrated that love by giving His Son to die on the cross. So our love for Him is a response to His first love. And after we understand what God has done for us, we can't help but say, yes, I want to love Him back. Then when we have responded to God by loving Him back, then we can be agents of His love to other people. When we have good relationships, we can be God's instruments in helping other people to follow Christ. You see, loving people can do more than minister to those who already know Christ. It can draw those who don't know Christ to Him. And when we have poor relationships, we can become stumbling blocks. We can push people farther away. And let's face it, there's a lot of hostility out there uh, in our world today, right? It seems like everyone is against everybody else. If we're called to be representatives of Christ, then leading people to 
reconciliation with Him, then love is our most powerful vehicle to do that. The command is clear we, that we are to make disciples throughout the world. So what is our message? Or, or what is our method, excuse me? Uh, it's to love and to show concern for other people and for their well-being. And if they can see in us this, this same attitude and lifestyle as Christ demonstrated, then they will be drawn to us just like they were drawn to Christ. And if they are then drawn to us, we can then point them to the source of our love, which is Jesus Christ. This kind of love for God and for others, it doesn't come natural for us. We've, we've talked about this before. Because down deep, we're, we're really interested in ourselves. We're, we're selfish beings. And only love that comes from God can, can move that selfishness away. The reality is that we can't do this without the help and the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We need His divine help on a daily basis to love the way that we ought. But we can find true victory in loving others. Strategy number three. We can experience true victory by obeying God. Trust and obey. You've heard that song, right? Trust and obey. Love and obey. For John, these concepts are really never separated. They, they go together. Because I believe God, I obey God. Because I love God, I obey God. You see how that works? And that's with good reason. Because John tells us that God's commandments are not a burden. Burdensome means heavy or crushing and oppressive. Have you ever talked to somebody who is not a Christian and you're trying to tell them about why you're a Christian and they say, there's so many rules. I want to be free. I want to do what I want to do. And you look at their life and it's a train wreck. And so I point them back to my life and I say, you know, I've been a a, a, a born-again Christian since I was eight years old. And I'm doing pretty good. You know? I have, a, I have a beautiful, loving, wonderful wife of 32 years. I have three boys. I have two grandkids. I live in a nice house. I get to do something that I actually, absolutely love all the time. What am I missing? Nothing. Because his commands are not burdensome. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Love for God, John says, is only real when we keep His commandments. To keep means to observe and to attend to carefully. Because love is not so much an emotional feeling as it is a moral action. It's not what you feel, it's what you do. Not only are they not a burden, but God's commands, I think, can be considered a blessing. Because obeying God tells God that I love Him. Obeying God's commandments sets us free. It doesn't enslave. His commandments are a blessing because they free me to live not as I want, but as I ought, as I should, in a way that is best for me that only the creator of me knows. Yeah. Obeying God's commands allow us to <coughs> overcome the world, which is our fourth strategy. We can experience the victory by overcoming the world. 
friends, God wants us to be overcomers. He wants us to have victory in our Christian life. That, that word that is translated victory and overcome, those are both forms of the same Greek root word, which means to conquer, to gain victory, to overcome. To each of the seven churches of Revelation, I know uh, uh, Brother Jim preached that the summer before I came. To each of those seven churches in the book of Revelation, John ended with a challenge for them to be overcomers, to be conquerors. To be victors. How do we overcome? Well verse 5 tells us. And it brings us full circle. And returns us back to verse 1. To be an overcomer. You must be a child of God. You must be born of God. Look at verse 4. For every child of God overcomes this evil world. And we achieve this victory through our faith. Remember what I said about saving faith. It is a whole person and life commitment to Jesus. It's giving everything I am, everything I have, everything I will be in faith to Jesus. Through our faith in Christ, through his cross, through his resurrection, we defeat Satan and sin and the evil system of this world with its idols, its greed, its murder, its racism, its immorality, its exploitation, and its oppression. Yes. We defeat the false teachers who oppose Christ. We defeat all those who oppose what is good. John starts the passage with believing in Jesus, and he ends this passage with believing in Jesus. Who Jesus is makes all the difference. Son of God means that Jesus has the nature of God. He came from God. He is God. He is the second person in the triune God. It is here and here alone. That true victory over this world can be won. Now let me conclude. Our new spiritual birth makes it possible to overcome the world and all of its temptations. But our victory, on a practical level, is not automatic. We will all struggle. We will all fail. <clears throat> But we can still have victory. Believing rightly, loving unconditionally, and obeying joyfully comes from where? The Word of God, our Bibles. And so overcoming the world requires our humble submission to the teaching of Scripture. It always comes back to this. Paul tells us plainly that we are fighting battles. That we are ill-equipped to win in the spiritual realm. Ephesians 6, 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Does that frighten you at all? That you have enemies that are against you that you cannot see. That are more powerful physically than you are. You are ill-equipped. I am ill-equipped to fight those battles. Do you find the temptation to sin to be unbearably strong? Do you find the commandments of God to be somewhat burdensome? Do you struggle to know the will of God in the face of so many worldly alternatives? Do you find your faith lacking? These are questions that we have to ask ourselves. Paul said in Romans 10, 17, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if we are to overcome, if we are to be everything that God intends us to be, then we must give ourselves to the reading and applying of God's word to our lives. 
Because it is our offensive weapon against all of these evil things, these unseen rulers and powers. It is the Bible. God's Word that is our sword. It is our strength. It enables us to fight against these. If we are to achieve true victory, then we must believe. We must love. And we must overcome. And all of that starts with God's Word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are great above all. You are almighty. You are all wise. And Father, we bow to your wisdom. And Lord, I pray that for each of us, that we open a 24-7 conduit back and forth to you. Lord, that we would pray without ceasing, that we would lean on your strength, that we would know your word so that we can overcome this world, so that we can be true victors. <coughs> we love you and we thank you for all that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. A little over, but...